Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ryan Jones, as I said earlier. I'm excited to be with you guys today. I was excited to be with you last week, but most certainly excited to be with you this week. And so uh, I've had a little bit of a week as far as getting prepared for this sermon, and so I'm hoping that you have as much of a difficult time in the next 30 or so minutes as I've had for the past seven days. So uh, I welcome you to my party. Um, but a little bit to introduce myself, um, my job title is the State Director of Missions, and uh, so I do work for Kevin White, and so I'd like to, uh, I guess, thank you in advance for bringing my boss to town once a week. That's a real uh, exciting thing I'm looking forward to. I'm just kidding on that. So <laughs> uh, Kevin is up in Reno. I'm down here in Vegas, and this is a new approach for the state convention, and having kind of a southern and northern front, if you will, and, and a connection to our pastors and churches, which seems to be going well. Um, so I, I did grow up in Ohio. I'm a Buckeye. And uh, are there any Florida State fans here today, by the way? Okay, good. That's a good sign. I would say, they, at the end of that game yesterday, they need to be at the front repenting every sin they've ever thought about committing. A uh, good night. I, I was blown away by that game last night if you watched that. So I am a Buckeye fan, so uh, we had a bye week yesterday, so um, I'm excited for next Saturday. But uh, I grew up in Ohio. I uh, did not necessarily grow up in a Christian home. And... Uh, in fact, I did not. I don't need to say I did not necessarily. I did not. And so I, I started following Christ when I was 15. Uh, my uncle invited me to go to church with him, and uh, I did that, and uh, eventually decided to, to follow Jesus. And uh, that's been an interesting journey. And so I spent some time in ministry and uh, got frustrated and thought this isn't what uh, I thought it was going to be. And so I went into the corporate world and did some sales and then got promoted to being a regional manager of a, a team of eight, which I'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, I don't wish that on anyone, just so that we're clear. Uh, I would look at the assistant and say, if I would just change a diaper today, I would know that I'm babysitting. And uh, it was horrid. Uh, but then just really couldn't get the, uh, the calling out of my head to go, to go into ministry. And so I, was, I owned a house in Ohio, and I remember exactly where I was at working in the yard. And I literally threw the shovel to the ground and said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And it's either get on with life and go to seminary and get back into ministry or never think about it again. And I was about to turn 30, and I thought, I'm not doing this when I'm 31, so decide today. And uh, the Lord used that, and that was his constant tugging on my heart. So I went to seminary and uh, did that in 2008, graduated in 2011, and then they brought me on staff there to uh, lead their church planting group and then uh, moved to Reno in January uh, to begin this position and then moved to Vegas uh, just in June. So, I mean, if you're going to move to Vegas, why not move in June, right? Yeah, that's great. That's great. I've been sweating like I'm sitting in a sauna, and it's just gross. So, um, so a little bit about what I do, and uh, if you don't understand what my job is, I fully understand because I've got friends even from high school that still don't get it. So I think it takes about 13.74 times to hear what I do before it starts to click. But I'll tell you what I don't do, um, and this is the rumor circulating my small town in Ohio. I'm not in Las Vegas swindling money from churches and individuals to fund my extravagant lifestyle. So that is not exactly what I do at all. So I want to make sure that's very clear. But as the state director of missions, <clears throat> uh, my responsibility, my main responsibility is to oversee our church planting efforts. So starting new churches across Nevada. So I'm working to recruit and, uh, and identify future pastors of new churches. And we have an assessment process that they go through that I oversee and really determining who we're going to partner with and what does that look like. And so uh, that's a large part of what I do. And then after they actually plant the church, there's ongoing coaching and training and things like that that I, that I provide for those, for those, uh, for those gentlemen. Uh, also oversee like our food pantry ministries. And then one thing is the Silver State Missions offering that you have collected yes, last week and today. And so just a little bit on that. That's an offering that's collected every year throughout the state of Nevada. Every year it has a different purpose. And so the designation this year is... Uh, the heartbeat of Kevin, my boss, is to form a partnership with the ministries that are going on in the Middle East, Northern Africa, Southeast Asia. And so we want to send a team of our pastors and denominational leaders to that area in the coming year to see what's going on missions-wise and how we can really join in and serve and encourage them with what they're already doing. Um, the other part of that is we want a lot of our churches to do exactly what was mentioned. By the way, if you're interested in donating a car to Trunk or Treat, please talk to me first. Um, I would be interested in talking. But... With a lot of our churches, we want them to do exactly what, what you're doing with that. So block parties, adopting a firehouse, adopting a school. Uh, if, you're, if the churches are interested in doing anything like that, providing lunch for a staff meeting at a school or a firehouse, we'll help provide some funds for that. So uh, that's the purpose of that offering. So hopefully you'll uh, 
you'll be excited to give to that and excited to know that we've uh, given out thousands of dollars just even in the past few months uh, for last year's purpose, which was Bible school and background checks for children's workers and training for children's workers as well. So we look forward to a positive uh, result from that and the, uh, the changes that's gonna, that, that will happen in the future with that. Um, but that being said, uh, let me pray. First of all, um, I'd like to say that you know, I was hired, <clears throat> I think, officially in November of last year. And part of that process was that Pastor Johnny was on the committee that hired me. So um, I'm honored to stand here today. Um, the other thing I would ask is that we are tell you is that we continue to pray for you as you see God's direction and face in finding a pastor and who's the next person to lead this church, and we're excited for that next chapter for you. Uh, another thing I would ask is that um, <clears throat> I was here with you guys last week for the uh, second service, and uh, as the afternoon progressed, I got a text message as I was packing to fly to Reno that the uh, missions pastor at Shadow Hills Church, not too far from here, 36 years old, passed in his sleep unexpectedly. So he left a wife and three kids, and uh, his mother is a friend of mine, and so that funeral is this afternoon. So I would ask you to be in prayer for that this afternoon. So let's go before God. Uh, God, we are thankful, God, for you, and uh, God, that we, Lord, we do come today waiting for you, and we do have our hands raised waiting for you, and Lord, you, your word says that your spirit is here, and we're so thankful for that, but we invite him to be here, and we invite him to move, <clears throat> and God, just as you've challenged me this week, and I feel like you've beaten me up a little bit, God, I pray that you would challenge, and I guess even beat up this morning. <laughs> And um, God, we pray for this church. And uh, God, that they would stay true to the mission that you've set before them. And uh, God, that you would provide a leader that would want to glorify you, want to honor you. And uh, God, would desire to lead and to serve this body. And God, we pray for the funeral this afternoon for Dustin. Lord, that you would, um, God, that you would change eternity during that funeral for people. I know that Dustin will want nothing short of that. And, uh, God, we are thankful for what you're going to do today. God, we pray that you would speak your words, Lord, that you would give us eyes that would see you, that we'd give us ears that would hear you, and Lord, that you would guide uh, our time together. And God, through all of that, we pray that you would be made famous in our hearts. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, so we're going to spend some time in Mark 10 this morning. So if you are, have a Bible, you're going to go ahead and turn to Mark 10. That's where we're going to be. A little background on where, uh, on what's gone on right before these, these verses have, uh, that we're going to look at have take place. Uh, the word tells us that Jesus was walking to Jerusalem with his 12 disciples. And as he's walking, he tells them that he is about to be arrested, he is about to be killed, and he will resurrect. Kind of a weird thing that, hey, we're walking to Jerusalem. I'm, let me tell you what's about to happen in my life. I'm about to be killed, and I'm going to come back to life, and you're never, you've never seen anything like it, but you're about to. And so they proceed with walking. And as they're walking to Jerusalem, I imagine that they're walking on a dirt road, maybe an occasional tree, maybe they've taken a break. And you've got two of the disciples, James and John, over on the side, and they say to Jesus, hey, come over here. So Jesus goes over to James and John, and they say, hey, we've got, basically they say, we've got a favor. We've got a special request to ask of you. And Jesus says, what can I do for you now? And they say, hey, we, we just want to know when we get to heaven, would it be cool if we sat on your left and your right side? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> the boldness. And so Jesus responds and says, hey, I, uh, I'm just not sure that you know what you're asking, and I'm really not sure that you're qualified. One of the, I don't know, I don't know that Jesus was the most tactful of people at times, but I think he maybe tried right there. <laughs> I'm just not sure you're quite qualified. So James and John, what's, their, what's the logical response? No, we are. We're good. Left and right sides, that's where we want to be. And Jesus says, hey, that's, it's really just not my decision. Well, word gets out to the other disciples what James and John have asked, and so they're what? They're a little bit ticked off. Well, wouldn't you be? They're a little bit jealous. And so Jesus, in verse 42 of Mark 10, it, Jesus pulls the disciples back together as a group. And in verse 42, Jesus says, Calling them to himself, like I said, he's bringing them back together. Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. 
But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you're like me, you highly value a quality customer service experience, right? You want to go back, you want to keep doing business, but when it's the other side of that coin and it's a negative experience, you just want to hang up the phone and be done, right? Well, a couple weeks ago, uh, my cable went out, and so I had to call the cable company, and no good story includes the phrase, I had to call the cable company, just so that we're clear. (laughs) So (laughs) I call the cable company, go through the automated system. I talk to a guy that says, well, I don't service Nevada accounts. I'm in Missouri. Well, then why am I talking to you? (laughs) So he sends me back. So I have to go through the automated system, and I get someone else that says, well, it's really a problem that's beyond what I'm able to to deal with. Then why am I talking to you? So they send me back to the automated system and to someone else. And at some point in dealing with the automated system, I just reached my boiling point. And I may have said, for the love If you do that, that will send you back to the beginning of the automated system. (laughs) Not fun. So negative customer service experience. So when we think of service, we think a lot of customer service, community service. But this is really what Jesus says about service, right? Firstly, we see here in in Mark 42 to 45 that Jesus tells the disciples, hey, the, the, the leadership of the Gentiles, they lord it over you. They do things that aren't right. They do things that aren't just. They abuse you with their power. And that's not going to be true of you. That's not how we're going to do things. So he tells them, this is what the culture is doing. This is what the culture says is acceptable. You are to be different. So he raises the bar on them a little bit there, right? But then he does what? He raises the bar again. Because he says, not only are you not to conduct yourselves the way that the culture does, but whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. So not only are you not to conduct yourselves the way that the culture and the leaders of your your day are doing, I want you to take it a step up. I want you to look at everyone as someone that you should be serving, that you're the servant to. And then he does what? He started here. He's gone here. Where do you think he's going next? Up here. (laughs) And just in case you need a reminder, remember what we just talked about as we're walking to Jerusalem? I'm about to be arrested. I'm about to be executed. And I will raise from death, from death, from the dead. So verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is saying, hey, if you need to see what this looks like, (laughs) and in the future, if you need a reminder, just watch me. Watch what's about to unfold in my life. And he says he gave his life as a ransom. That means that there was a payment that that Jesus, the Bible tells us Jesus gave his life so that you and I could be in a right relationship with God as the ultimate form, as the ultimate example of service. So you're not to conduct yourselves as the culture around you. In fact, let's up it. You're to view everyone as someone that you should and could be serving. Let's take it a little step higher. (laughs) Watch me with what I'm about to do with my life. Watch me with what I'm about to do for you. Watch me with how I'm about to serve you. Now, I just moved to Nevada in, uh, in January. And so I would say that the, the, there's a little bit of a culture difference. Uh, I was in Virginia before I got out here. And um, part of what I, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, but part of the cultural difference here is that it's a very me-focused culture in general, especially outside the church. And, I mean, for example, I was, uh, I was driving to go to a meeting last weekend, and um, there was a girl that pulled up beside me, and I really was not paying attention until it unfolded, and I put it 
put the pieces together in retrospect. She pulled up beside me and wanted to get in front of me to get onto the exit lane. Well, there were five or six car lengths behind me where there was nobody, but she wanted in front of me. And again, I really wasn't paying attention, so I just kept going. Well, and I realized what had happened, and I looked back, and she's, she's saying hello with one finger, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> because she wanted in front of me. That was her spot. And I'll admit, the thought crossed my mind, just blow her a kiss. I didn't, I promise. I, <laughs> I, I thought about it, I thought, that's not good, just let it go. So Jesus commands us to serve. If this is his teaching to the disciples, don't you think it's probably the same for you and me today? Don't operate in a way that your culture operates. View everyone as someone that you could be serving. And in case you need a reminder, forget what it looks like, just look to the cross. The leaders of the Gentiles were very uh, obsessed with power, and, uh, and with position. And I think we see the same thing in our culture today, do we not? Agreed? Uh, look at politics. I mean, isn't that the foundation for communism? You got one person who wants to be in control and decide everything for everybody? If you're not a political person, uh, I welcome you to the 2014 season of the National Football League. <laughs> I won't go into specifics, but uh, definitely some interesting stuff going on in the NFL besides touchdowns and field goals. Um, and even for myself, you know, I'm, I'm from Cincinnati area originally, I'm a Bengals fan, and uh, I'm firstly thankful that the controversy is not around us for once, uh, it seems like that's always the case, but, uh, but you know, my Bengals at this point are undefeated, and I can keep that in my mind, I've got that memorized. But on top of knowing that they're undefeated, guess what I want to know? I want to know where they stand on the what? Power rankings. So beyond the record, you've got all these sports writers that are experts, and they all get together, and they decide who's playing the best and who has the most potential. And I was super excited last weekend when my Bengals were ranked number two in one of the power rankings that I, that I read. And I get all excited about it, and I'm worked up thinking the Bengals finally might do something. We finally might win a playoff game. And I realized, this is all hypothetical. <laughs> what do I care? Why am I so worked up about this? But even within that, we're obsessed with, with the power and the position. We want to know that our team is the best. And we've got athletes on those teams willing to do anything to maintain their status as being the best in their position. But that's contrary to our culture. And if you doubt that in politics or in sports, that's something that was made very real to me when I worked in the corporate world. Uh, when I got promoted to being a manager, uh, I got promoted over a lot of people that had been there a lot longer than I had been there. And as soon as that announcement was made, guess what? I start getting intoxicated text messages at 3 and 4 in the morning, accusing me of things that I never would think to do. People were obsessed with that position. They were obsessed with that power. Let's turn over to Philippians 2. <clears throat> So we see throughout the Gospels, and Jesus, Jesus taught here in Mark to serve, to be a servant. And he even said, look at me as the ultimate example. And in Philippians 2, this is one of my favorite passages, by the way. Uh, Philippians 2, Paul says in verse 4, verses 4 through 7, Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. So Paul tells us in retrospect, hey, this man Jesus, he did it. He lived it. And your attitude should be the same as his. He was God. He was God. But we find Jesus living a life of servanthood, don't we? As an example, you know, Jesus was invited to a house for dinner. And he walks in. And instead of walking in and saying, hey, I'm Jesus, the Son of God, I'll sit right here in the cushiest seat that you've got, thank you. He does what? He washes feet. 
Now, I personally think feet are disgusting. And if I'm going to wash your feet, there's a good chance there's going to be a bucket of water and an empty bucket for other things that might come up. All right? Because feet are just gross to me, and I can't even imagine washing feet. But that was a task reserved for a servant, for a slave. But Jesus is doing it. So can you imagine that scene that the other house guests walk in, and they come in, they take their sandals off, and... They're expecting the slave person, the servant, to come out and wash their feet. Instead, Jesus, this guy that's claiming to forgive sin, that's claiming to be the Messiah, he comes over and washes their feet. Can you imagine the confusion and the looks that went on in that room? And then can you imagine when the slave person walks in to do their job, and again, here's Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man, forgives sins, washing feet. And the slave person looks at it and says, I, I, I can do that. And Jesus says, I've got it. A slave person says, but, but that's my responsibility. Like, that's what I'm here to do. I've got it, man. Okay, so the slave person kind of <laughs> scratching their head, you know, kind of walks back um, into the kitchen, maybe with the other slaves, and they say, dude, you're supposed to be washing feet right now, and you know what's going to happen if you don't wash those feet. Well, this guy named Jesus has got it. I mean... I, He's doing it. So we see that Jesus commanded us to serve, but we also see a life of service. And as, this is the part where I kind of got beaten up a little bit in studying for this message. When, when I've looked at the scriptures in the past and looked at the miracles of Christ, I think I've always thought that Jesus was performing miracles to show the world who he is. I'm just not sure that that's the case. I think that was part of his motivation. But if Jesus is the son of man, and he's God, I mean, we live in Las Vegas. There's hardly anywhere you can go in the city and you can't see at least some sort of remnant of the strip, right? On a billboard or you can see the lights. So if I'm Jesus, I'm thinking, I'm just going to get a big electrical sign like down on the strip in Las Vegas, and it'll be different colored bulbs. They're going to flash at different times, and it'll say, yes, I'm Jesus. Yes, I'm the son of man. And I'm just going to stand underneath it with an arrow pointing down to me. Here I am. And if that doesn't work, I might even walk over to Caesar's palace and see when Celine Dion was performing and she can come out and sing How Great Thou Art beside me because that'll surely draw a crowd, right? Here I am, Jesus, son of man, Celine, singing, here I am. Or if Jesus is text savvy, maybe he would set up a Facebook profile and on the about page he would just say, Jesus, Messiah, and go through and friend request everyone in the world. So they get a friend request from Jesus the Nazarene and they're like, who is this guy? Oh, he says he's the Messiah. I mean, that just seems a little bit easier to me. But as I've looked at Jesus' miracles, I think that he really was trying to show us the heartbeat of service and the heartbeat of ministry. I think that was his motivation in combination with showing the world who he was. And if you think about it, what did Jesus profit turning water into wine? What did Jesus profit raising a dead girl back to life? What did Jesus profit feeding 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread and some fish? I mean, he's God. He could have had it himself or just gone behind a tree and requested his own and done deal. He's good. And what did it profit Jesus to heal a man and tell him to go, but not to tell anyone what happened? Right? What did Jesus get out of any, any of those things? I think his goal was to show you and me what it means to minister to the people around us that are hurting, that are broken. And uh, for me, uh, this was made very real to me a few years ago. And like I said, I was in Virginia. I went to seminary there. So I was going to school full-time for my master's. I was working full-time in the seminary. And I was working part-time uh, for a church plant an hour away from where I lived. And in case you're wondering, that is some sort of recipe for insanity. So uh, that was not good. <laughs> and so uh, my dad, my parents were still in Ohio. And you need to understand that my dad and I, um, we just never really had a good relationship. And we spent most of the time butting heads. I didn't like my dad a lot. I struggled to love him at times. It wasn't good. I resented him for who he was. 
And I, if I'm being honest, I think I was disappointed a lot. And that carried over into adulthood. And so I'm headed home for Thanksgiving break, and I'm thinking, finally, I have a week where I'm not reading a book, writing a paper, grading someone else's paper, or planning a church service or a Bible study. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Well, my dad called, and uh, he said, hey, there's this place in town where they're clearing trees, and so there's all these trees, there are all these trees that are down, and if you can come in and cut, load, and haul your own firewood, it's all free. So I've been going and getting all the firewood I can get. Okay? So when you come home for Thanksgiving, do you think you could help me split this wood? You've got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. Not exactly the break from books and papers and planning Bible studies that I wanted. So I said, I'll think about it. So the next day I called and I had my plan. And I said, I will give you one day to split wood. Well, Ryan, there's a lot of firewood. Okay, I'll give you a day. Conversation ends. And I've set a boundary, right? I said, this is how we're, this is, these are the rules for me to play the game. So the next day, you know, I'm calling my parents just to see what's going on. And my dad says, oh, by the way, I rented that log splitter for three days so we can split wood for the whole weekend. <laughs> what? So I went from here to here like that. Furious, fuming, wanting to cuss, if I'm being honest. And I may have cussed in my head. <laughs> Not happy. I'm thinking, I set a boundary. You just blew through it like a bull in a china shop. And now my relaxing week is going to be spent splitting wood? So I get off the phone. And I stewed on this, and I stewed on this, and I stewed on this. And I met a buddy of mine for coffee, and I'm explaining to him like, what's going on in my life, why I'm so angry. And my buddy looks at me and says, Ryan, what if you just split the wood? You haven't heard what I've said for the past 10 minutes. Let me try this again. No, 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 I've got you. <laughs> what if you just split the wood? Now I'm furious again in a whole new level. It was just a week of anger. <laughs> and so I walk away from that conversation. And I'm thinking, what if he's right? He does tend to be a little bit more gracious than I am at times. <laughs> and so I make a decision that I'm going to split the wood. So I go home, and my dad has wood, and I'm not exaggerating this at all. He has firewood stacked just below this rafter. And it was the width of the driveway, so twice as wide as this inset here. And it was probably about 30 feet deep. That's a lot of firewood. <laughs> And some of the pieces were from the bottoms of tree trunks. All right, now if you've ever split wood, you can't just roll that piece or guide it down the log splitter because it does what? It jams up the whole thing, and then you're really angry. <laughs> so you've got to, by myself, had to bear hug these pieces on my thighs, in my arms, and walk them like this, and whittle them down to smaller, more manageable pieces. So at the end of the two days, two and a half days it took us to split all of this wood, Scrapes, bruises, and blood. So we got all the wood split. So I go on home, or, you know, finish the week there, mom and dad, drive back to Virginia. I call my parents just to tell them, hey, eight-hour drive went okay, I'm here, I'm safe, we're good. And my dad gets on the phone. And as I'm talking to my dad, we're just kind of chit-chatting, I hear a... Uh, And it keeps increasing in frequency. And finally I said, are you crying? What is wrong? Floodgates. He just broke down. And he said, Ryan, you know, I was out there today and I was, uh, I was cleaning up some of the bark and the scraps from splitting the wood. And uh, I just stopped. And I went over to that wood pile and I just put my hand on the top of it. And I just stood in the backyard and cried. He said, I just, I'm so thankful for that time with you. I'm thankful that you had other things you wanted to do, but you took the time to help me 
and do what I wanted to do and what it needed to get done. That means the world to me. Now, I can't explain to you what happened in that act of splitting wood, but somehow God used that. And God changed my relationship with my dad from night to day. My dad calls me. He wants to know what's going on in my life. He wants to know about my job. When I moved to Las Vegas, he was so excited to see my house. Somehow in the act of splitting wood, I learned to show grace to my dad that I had never shown him before. I learned to love my dad in a way that I had never loved him before. And I realized all those years of me being angry at him for not being the father that I want him to be, that was my fault. I needed to love him for who he is, not for who I wanted him to be. And in the Old Testament, when God showed up and did something, they built what was called an Ebenezer. And they would stack a pile of rocks so that they would know, this is where the Lord showed up, this is where the Lord did something in my life. They had a visual reminder of that. And so my parents drove out to spend Easter with me in Reno. I said, Dad, I need you to bring me a piece of firewood. Well, you're in an apartment. I know. I just need a piece of that firewood. This is my Ebenezer. That God showed up. God did something that day that I never thought he would do. I was prepared. This is my visual that God showed up that day amongst firewood more than I ever wanted to see. (laughs) But it's my reminder to serve. Jesus commanded us to do that in Mark. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that he set a great example of that. So all this being said, what do we do with this? Number one, if you're not a follower of Christ, we see that he says he lays down his life as the ultimate form of service to us. If you haven't made the decision to follow him and to accept his forgiveness, the ultimate form of service that he offers, I think that's your step today. If you'd like to talk about that, I'll be here. The church leaders will be here. If you are a follower of Christ, I'm convinced that acts of service and engaging our communities by doing trunk or treat and things like that, that that really is how God, that plays a large role in God's expanding his kingdom in this church and in this city and in this state. But that has to play out in our individual lives as well. And so if you're a follower of Christ, you should have gotten a bulletin or something to write on. If you got a pen or pencil, I would encourage you to think of a way this week that you can practically serve someone in your life. And if you need to write that down so that you can remember it, write it down. And so for you, it might be that you pick up the phone and you call someone you haven't talked to in a while and say, hey, I just want you to know I love you and I appreciate you. It might be that you, uh, you might know a single mother in your neighborhood. Maybe you go to the movie theater and get some gift cards and take those to that mother and say, hey, I just want you to be able to take your kids to see a movie. It might be that you bring in all kinds of candy for trunk or treat. And God forbid, it might even mean you have to split some wood. <laughs> but during our time of invitation, if you don't know Christ, I would, I would encourage you to come forward so we can talk about that, and if that's a desire of your heart, if God's working. If you are a follower of Christ, first of all, identify your practical act of service this week. Pray that God would bless it. Pray that God would use it. And pray that God would use that as a a turning point in your relationship or even that person's relationship with Christ. And if you want to do that in your seats, that's fine. If you would rather come to the altar and dedicate your act of service that way, that's fine as well. Oh, but let us pray. God, we are thankful for you, that you are, um, God, that you really showed your heart through Jesus. And through him, you showed us who you want us to be, the servants you've called us to be. And God, I pray that that will be true of this church and of this body and of these people, 
Lord, that they would see you as the ultimate example, the ultimate act of service. And God, that they would very practically seek to serve other people. And Jesus, I pray that you show up. I pray that they can have their own Ebenezer of how you worked and how you changed that relationship or you changed eternity on that day. And God, for those that don't know you, we pray that you would do that today, that you would change eternity, that you would change their lives today. God, that you invite them into relationship with you. And God, for that, we praise you, we thank you, and God, that we pray that this time will glorify you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Thank you, Ryan. We pray for you and the work that you're doing in our state. There's so much uh, that has to be done and needs to be done in our state. And the, the scriptures remind us the fields are wide into harvest and laborers are few. And this is one of the laborers that's on the front line. And pray for him and the work that he and uh, Kevin and all the leadership in our state are a part of. And they're here to help facilitate what we do because we're on the front lines, too. We just have to remember that God's calling us to step up here in Spring Valley. To find places to minister, to serve and be Christ's hand in the community. Pray that you have a great afternoon in the Lord. And pray once again for the pastor search team and the leadership of our church. And one thing that I challenge the choir to do Wednesday night. Pray for that man. God knows who he is. Pray for the ministry where he is right now. He has a church home right now. And he has a church family. And he has a family that's plugged into a church. And God is preparing their hearts right now to disengage there and to come here. So pray for that man and his family. We pray real general sometimes, but there is an individual. Pray for that individual, his family, his children, his spouse, and the church where he is right now. They don't want to see him leave. They don't want him to be come out here to be with us wherever he is. But God knows who he is and wants to prepare his church to send them. So pray for that man, his family, and that church this week. Have a great afternoon.